In this video lecture, we're going to cover reproductive and urinary medications. Well, here we are again with the gonadotrophin hormones. These hormones help the ovaries and the testes work at their very best. The pituitary gland secretes luteinizing hormone, or LH, which initiates the release of the egg and causes the secretion of estrogen and progesterone. It also produces the interstitial cell stimulating hormone, or ICSH, which is the male equivalent of LH, which controls testosterone production. The follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, controls sperm and egg production. Some of the most common drugs used for contraception are based on hormones that a woman naturally makes. When these hormone medications are used, they stop pregnancy by overriding the body's ability to make estrogens and progesterone, the two main hormones secreted by the ovaries. Contraceptives contain such low doses of hormones that it stops the ability to conceive, they stop ovulation, fertilization, implantation, and fetal growth. One of the most common forms of birth control is the pill. It's available in all kinds of formulations that provide different amounts of estrogen. Monophasic pills have the same amount of hormone for 21 days. Biphasic birth control pills have the same dose of estrogen, but two different doses of progesterone in the monthly cycle. Triphasic birth control pills have three different strengths which, with various doses of both estrogen and progesterone. The mini pill, progesterone, contains only progesterone, so it's slightly less effective. The manufacturer makes a wide variety of birth control pills that best suit each individual woman. Sometimes patients may experience symptoms of pregnancy while taking contraceptive pills because normal reproductive function shuts down so the body acts like it's pregnant so there may be weight gain, mood swings, and breast tenderness for example. If contraception fails or it's not used properly, a woman can use post-colloidal high-dose estrogen to prevent pregnancy. Plan B is an example of this. These medications should be taken within 72 hours and preferably within 12 hours after sex. They can prevent pregnancy by doing one of three things. They can temporarily stop the release of an egg from the ovary. They can prevent fertilization or they can prevent a fertilized egg from attaching to the uterus. There are a lot of different options for contraception besides the pill. Contraceptive implants have hormones that stop ovulation, they stop the sperm from reaching the uterus, and they stop implantation. These implants are small plastic rods that are placed under the skin in the upper arm, and they're good for about three years. The contraceptive ring contains estrogen and progesterone, which is placed into the vagina every month. After three weeks, it's removed, and this lets the woman have a normal period. These medications stop ovulation, fertilization, and implantation. An intrauterine device, or IUD, like levonorgestrel or Mirena, these contain progesterone. It's placed in the uterus by a physician. There's also the copper IUD, which is naturally toxic to the sperm. All of these hormone-based contraceptive medications must be taken with care. They have a risk of serious side effects such as formation of blood clots, especially in women older than 35. Smoking also increases the risk of blood clots, so women who take contraceptive medications and smoke are at especially high risk. Women with a history of blood clots or disorders that involve the vascular system should not be prescribed these medications. Condoms and diaphragms are barrier devices. Diaphragms are used in combination with spermicides. The barrier devices are the only method effective against sexually transmitted diseases, as well as preventing pregnancy. Menopause is the permanent cessation of menses. Many women may choose to take hormone replacement therapy to replace hormones that are no longer being nat naturally made. If estrogen is taken with progesterone, the risk of endometrial cancer is higher. These medications can cause cramping and bleeding, so should not be taken by women on blood thinners. Estrogen comes in oral forms, creams, and patches. The benefits of hormone replacement therapy are decreased bone loss and decreased risk of heart disease. Individual risks of developing heart disease, you know, depends on many factors, including family history, personal medical history, and lifestyle. 
These medications have been shown, though, to increase the risk of breast cancer, stroke, and blood clots, although these studies have really been controversial. The choice to use hormone replacement therapy is a very personal decision, and as with all medications, the pros and cons should be weighed and discussed with the physician. Hormone replacement therapy can be used to treat prostate cancer in men because estrogen decreases testosterone levels. Men are believed to have their own form of menopause where the testosterone levels diminish. The most common androgen testosterone is androgel. It's administered through a gel that is rubbed into the skin. Side effects are headache, decreased libido, anxiety, depression, and gynecomastia or enlargement of male breasts. For women, they may be amenorrhea or absence of menses. There really are some safety directions with these medications. Androgel can transfer from the user's body to others. This can happen if other people come into contact with the area where the androgel was applied. Signs of puberty can happen in young children who were accidentally exposed to testosterone through skin-to-skin -skin contact. Women and children should avoid contact with the unwashed or unclothed area where androgel has been applied. Luprolide or Lupron is a synthetic gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist. It works by decreasing levels of certain hormones produced by the testes and ovaries. This can be used for prostate cancer to stop the growth of certain tumors that need these hormones to grow. It can be used in, in women to treat symptoms of endometriosis, which is an overgrowth of the uterine lining outside of the uterus, or also for uterine fibroids. Monthly injections can be given, but they're not used for more than six months. We also have medications that can be used for labor. Cervical ripening agents can be applied topically to the cervix, which softens the cervix to prepare for labor. A commonly used medication in labor and delivery is oxytocin or pitocin, which is a pituitary hormone that causes the uterus to contract. These medications are given IV in a very controlled way in a controlled setting. They may also be given postpartum or after the baby is delivered to control bleeding. Tocolytics stop or slow contractions. Terbutaline and magnesium sulfate are examples of these. Side effects of these medications include hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, and weakness. Symptoms of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or formerly known as PMS, are hot flashes, depression, anxiety, and pain. SSRIs, remember our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, may be used to relieve these symptoms. On this slide also are medications that are used for infections caused by S STDs. Metronidazole is an antibacterial. Acyclovir is an antiviral. And myconazole is an antifungal. Erectile dysfunction is a common disorder and is frequently related to arterial sclerosis, diabetes, stroke, hypertension, or has psychological roots. These medications dilate the arteries leading to the penis and they constrict the veins. Medications like phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, boy that's a mouthful, they hold blood in the penis to sustain an erection. These medications can be dangerous for individuals with a history of heart disease, stroke, and eye problems. Individuals who take nitrates cannot take these medications because they cause severe hypotension. Sildenafil or Tadalafil are examples of these drugs. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about urinary medications. We discussed diuretics in the cardiovascular system, but we're going to briefly look at these important medications again. The components of the urinary system include the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder, and the urethra. The kidneys filter the blood to make urine, and they remove the waste products that they filtered out. The kidneys are so important, they regulate electrolytes, they help maintain acid-base balance, they maintain water and sodium levels in the body, and they regulate blood pressure. They secrete a horm hormones, one which was erythropoietin, that stimulates red blood cell production, and another hormone is renin, which we talked about with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that helps regulate blood pressure and aldosterone levels. The nephron is the working unit of the kidney, and each kidney contains over a million nephrons. 
The glomerulus is a capillary network of capillaries, and they keep normal proteins and cells in the bloodstream, and they allow waste and excess fluids and other substances to pass through. Blood is filtered into the Bowman's capsule, which I think of like a strainer. The filtrates exit the Bowman's capsule into the renal tubules, which are tiny tubes where the waste, extra fluids, and other recyclable substances like sodium, potassium, are filtered out from the glomerulus. Many of your diuretics work in the tubules. Our bodies must have electrolytes to function properly. The major electrolytes are sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. We can replace these electrolytes with IV or PO supplements. Diuretics in general disrupt the exchange of electrolytes in the tubules of the nephron. Where, when most sodium is caused to be excreted, water binds to the sodium and follows it into the toilet during urination. This leaves you with a much lower blood volume and it decreases your blood pressure. That's why we frequently use these medications for hypertension. Other valuable electrolytes may be lost, so these medications require very close monitoring of the electrolytes. The loop diuretics work in the loop of Henle. These are our heavy hitters. They help decrease the volume of blood that the heart must circulate through the body. They also decrease the fluid in the lungs, making it easier for individuals to breathe and helps the kidneys make more urine for those with renal insufficiency. These medications end in MIDE, most of them, and we have to monitor potassium levels because potassium can be lost with these medications. Thiazide diuretics, which end in thiazide, work further down in the nephron in the distal convoluted tubule, blocking sodium reabsorption and increases water excretion. Again, you must watch your potassium levels. Potassium sparing diuretics are aldosterone inhibitors. Aldosterone is produced by the kidneys and it's all about conserving sodium. Aldosterone usually exchanges the sodium for potassium in the renal tubules. If aldosterone is inhibited, sodium goes into the toilet and potassium is preserved. So patients must be watched for hyperkalemia or high potassium with these medications. Osmotic diuretics are used for patients who have increased intracranial pressure from head trauma or high intraocular pressure in the eye or those in renal failure to lower the amount of edema. They work by pulling more fluid out of the body tissues and into the circulation. And patients must be closely monitored during the administration of these medications. Benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH it's a condition generally found in older men in which the prostate gland is enlarged and not cancerous. The prostate gland surrounds the urethra, which is the tube that carries urine from the bladder out of the body. As the prostate gets bigger, it may squeeze or partially block the urethra. This causes problems with urination. We discuss these alpha adrenergic blockers in our nervous system um, section. These medications help relieve BPH symptoms by relaxing the smooth muscle in the prostate gland, which improves urination. We have to watch for palpitations and decreased libido. Some of these medications may have an effect of the vascular smooth muscle, and this may affect vasodilation, which in turn brings blood pressure down. So watch for hyper hypotension or orthostatic hypotension, which is a drop in blood pressure when patients stand. Urinary tract infections can cause pain, urgency, frequency, and blood in the urine. We use antibiotics like Augmentin, which is a amoxicillin analog, which means it's similar but not identical to amoxicillin. As you notice from the name, it's a combination drug, and part of the drug is from the penicillin family. Bactrim is also a combination antibiotic from the sulfonamides family. Peridium is a non-opioid analgesic, and it's an interesting drug because it provides analgesia for the urinary tract by acting locally on the urinary tract mucosa to produce an analgesic effect. Well, that concludes the video lecture on reproductive and urinary system medications. If you have any questions, bring them to class.